Now we're going to do a diagrammatic example of the existence of public goods. We're going to stick with our example of street lights introduced in the first part of this lesson. In the table on the left here, we've got a hypothetical situation in which there is a small town with 100 citizens deciding how many street lights to install on the main street, let's say. So we've got in the table here the marginal benefits and marginal costs of street lamps for an individual in this small town. Let's assume that this individual's marginal benefit expressed in dollars represents that of a typical individual in this town. Notice that for the first street lamp, this individual would be willing to pay $14. For the second street lamp, only $12. The third street lamp, $10, and so on. The willingness of the individual to pay for additional street lamps decreases the more street lamps are provided. You can see that beyond seven street lamps, this individual is not willing to pay anything for an eighth street lamp, presumably because the marginal benefit or the enjoyment or utility the individual would receive from the eighth lamp is zero. Let's look at the marginal social benefit. The marginal social benefit represents the benefit or the willingness of all of society all 100 citizens in this small town to pay for street lamps. For the first street lamp, all the individuals in this town, all 100 of them, would be willing to pay up to $1,400. Notice that the $1,400 is found by multiplying the individual's marginal benefit or willingness to pay for the first street lamp by the population of the town. So 14 times 100, that's $14 per person, times 100 people equals $1,400 and so on. There are 100 fairly similar individuals in this town. When you multiply each of their willingnesses to pay by the population, you get the total marginal social benefit for street lamps in this town. So for example, people in this town would be willing to pay $600 for a fifth street lamp and $400 for a sixth street lamp and so on. The law of diminishing marginal benefit explains why people are willing to pay less for each additional street lamp. Having street lamps every 2 meters makes no sense, but having street lamps every 30 or 40 meters might make perfect sense. We can easily graph the social marginal benefit curve by plotting the relationship between the quantity of street lamps and the willingness of society as a whole to pay for street lamps. So for example, the first street lamp, society is willing to pay $1,400 for. So I can put a point right here on my marginal social benefit curve. And the seventh street lamp, society is willing to pay $200 for. So I can put a point down here at a quantity of seven and $200. And now I can connect these two points and I have this community's marginal social benefit curve for street lamps. The blue line here represents the marginal social benefit for street lamps. This could be viewed as the community's demand for street lamps. Let's look at the marginal social cost of street lamps. Due to the law of increasing opportunity cost, or the law of diminishing marginal returns, as it has been taught in previous lessons, the cost of providing additional street lamps increases slightly. So the fifth street lamp, for instance, costs more to provide than the fourth street lamp. Resources become more scarce, therefore the cost of providing additional street lamps increases. We can plot the marginal cost curve by putting a couple points from this supply schedule, as this can be considered, onto our graph. The cost of providing the first street lamp is $400, so I can put a point right here. And the cost of providing the seventh street lamp is $700, so I can put a point out here at a quantity of seven at a price of $700. I can easily connect these two points to get my marginal social cost curve, which could be considered the supply curve for street lamps in this small town. Here's our marginal social cost curve. Now comparing the marginal social cost of street lamps and the marginal social benefit of street lamps, it's easy to find the socially optimal quantity of street lamps that should be provided. My graph may be drawn somewhat imprecisely, but I can see that right at around $600, the marginal social benefit equals the marginal social cost, which occurs at an equilibrium quantity of around five street lamps. So the socially optimal quantity, we'll call this QSO, occurs where marginal social cost equals marginal social benefit. So what leads to the market failure here? Why, without government provision, will less than five street lamps be provided? In fact, far less than five street lamps will be provided unless the city provides them itself. 
the free market will not provide these street lamps. And the reason has to do with the free rider problem outlined in the first part of this lesson. The free rider problem exists when an individual underreports his or her demand for a public good. What if the individual citizens of this city do not admit or are not willing to actually pay what they say they are willing to pay? And to be frank, why would they be? Every individual in this city has an incentive not to pay for these street lamps once they have been provided. Let's show the effect of a single individual refusing to pay for street lamps. If one individual refused to pay for street lamps, then the marginal social benefit would be slightly lower than it is in our graph here. If a single individual in this town refused to pay for the street lamps once they had been provided, then we could show this as a slight decrease in the marginal benefit of street lamps. So the red line here would be the social benefit if one individual opted not to pay for street lamps because we could subtract the $14 that an individual is willing to pay for the first street lamp from the $1,400 that society as a whole is willing to pay and we would get a slight inward shift so we could subtract the $14 here and we get a slight downward shift of demand. Now if one individual opted not to pay for the street lamps, in other words, acted like a free rider, then we could still have a nearly socially optimal number of street lamps. It would be a minuscule decrease in the quantity here from the socially optimal quantity. However, what if every individual, what if all 100 citizens in this town refused to pay for the street lamps once they had been provided? What happens is that the marginal private benefit or the private demand for street lamps would continue to shift left due to the fact that at each quantity, individuals are opting out of paying for the street lamps. So at, at two street lamps, for example, if a dozen or two dozen citizens opted not to pay for these, let's say that 20 citizens opted not to pay for the street lamps, you would have a marginal benefit that was quite a bit less than the marginal social benefit. But this rationale continues. Every individual has an incentive to free ride once the street lamps have been provided. So what we end up with is a marginal benefit curve or a demand curve that is almost close to zero here. At every quantity, the willingness of society to pay for these street lamps because everyone has an incentive to free ride would be much lower. We end up with a situation where the marginal private benefit curve is much lower than the marginal social benefit curve. In other words, the actual demand for street lamps will be almost zero, despite the fact that everybody as a whole benefits from street lamps. Every individual has an incentive to free ride. And what we end up with is an equilibrium quantity of street lamps of zero in the free market. So we could say the free market quantity of street lamps will be zero because the marginal social cost will be higher than the marginal private benefit because individuals will be unwilling to pay for street lamps once they have been provided. So this poses quite a dilemma. When the socially optimal quantity is out here at QSO, where marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost, but the equilibrium quantity is all the way down here at zero, we have an under provision by the free market. The solution to this market failure obviously is government provision. It cannot be optional or voluntary for individuals to pay for the use of a public good. The payment for public goods must be undertaken through the tax system. Governments will collect taxes and provide public goods so that they can be provided at a level closer to the socially optimal level. All sorts of public goods exist. Military defense, street lights, sewage systems are paid for entirely through taxpayers' money. Without government provision of these goods, the free market would fail to allocate any resources towards them and there would be a market failure. The graphical analysis here showed that there is a socially optimal quantity of a public good where marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost. However, due to the free rider problem, individuals will not actually be willing to pay for a public good once it has been provided. Because of this failure of the market system, the government must provide public goods at a level that it deems socially optimal. Mm -hmm.